afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. Um, today we have the pleasure of having John Rogers, uh, who's going to tell us about his flexible skin sensor to detect uh, blood flow. Good day, John. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? It's good to be it's, here. John's out in, uh, I guess you're out in L.A. Uh, I'm in Illinois, so call me. Oh, oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> I get con At my age, John, you get confused. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways... Um, John, could you just let's start things off by uh, just telling a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're at, and your background, your scientific background, please. Yeah, sure. So I'm on the faculty here at University of Illinois, the uh, Urbana-Champaign campus. My um, home department is material science and engineering, but I have uh, joint apart, uh, appointments in a number of other different departments: bioengineering, electrical, mechanical, chemistry, so on, and. Um, you know, my interest is in advanced electronic materials and devices with an emphasis on uh, you know, biomedical um, technologies, uh, implantables, uh, skin wearables for you know, continuous health and wellness monitoring at the home, clinical tools, research, uh, grade devices, surgical implements, thing, things of that nature. Uh, so I'm very much a device guy. Um, most of the work or almost all of the work that we do in this space uh, is typically uh, involving very close uh, collaborations with uh, clinicians uh, because they uh, have the best view on where the unmet needs are. And then we come in with, you know, novel ideas around device architectures and materials and uh, capabilities to try to address those needs. Um, before I was at Illinois, I was on the staff at Bell Labs. Uh, uh, and so a lot of the research that we have here in my academic group has that kind of Bell Labsian flavor we're sort of science in the service of uh you know technologies that could address um you know grand challenges in in human health in particular you know you know you know john i wasn't wasn't familiar with the bell bell labsian as you phrase it uh approach to uh using technologies they're involved in healthcare a lot huh well not not so much i was thinking more bell labs in the historical sense of uh you know, an industrial research and development outfit that, uh, you know, is able to do world-class science. I think, you know, eight or nine Nobel Prizes came out of the labs, um, you know, since its founding to, to the present time, but really not ivory tower type research, Nobel level research, but in the context of uh, technologies that that uh, you know have utility in, in our communication infrastructure. So it's that style that we try to uh, we try to embed, you know, in, in our programs here, uh, but the but the technical, you know, outlets are completely different. It's not communications anymore for us anyway. It's more, you know, kind of in this in this medical device area. Uh, did you notice at a young age that your affinity for computers? Uh, yeah, my dad had a PhD in physics, and so, you know, I've been kind of immersed in a science type environment, um, you know, my entire life. I did uh, my undergraduate degrees at University of Texas at Austin in chemistry and in physics. I was a PhD student at MIT, graduated there in 1995 with a, with a degree in physical chemistry, two master's degrees, physics and chemistry. I was a postdoc at Harvard uh, and then, you know, went, went to Bell Labs after that. Well, I can't believe I have a BA in anthropology. I'm on the same screen as you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Urbana, that's the center of uh, supercomputers, right? Yeah, there's an amazing, um, you know, history of accomplishment in, in electrical engineering, material science, chemistry, physics, and uh, computer science. So if you've seen the movie 2001, HAL was actually uh, built in Urbana. So, you know, I think it's had a really illustrious, uh, you know, history and it's kind of bed itself, you know, in the, in the public knowledge around, you know, uh, the history of, of computer science, uh, you know, Netscape has its origins here, lots of things, YouTube, so on. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting environment, huge uh, engineering college, about 500 faculty. And it was one of the things that attracted me to the place, you know, when I decided to move back to academia from Bell Labs is the sheer size coupled with the high quality just creates all sorts of uh, really fantastic, uh, you know, collaborative opportunities for doing interdisciplinary stuff. And I think if you want to take materials all the way to medical devices, there's just a lot of, you know, different disciplines that have to be brought to bear, you know, in order to make that uh, sort of a successful effort. And, um, you know, Illinois has been a great place for us in that sense. Okay. Oh, let me, okay, we'll get to the uh, skin sensor, the flexible skin sensor. 
And let me try to set this up here. Um, okay. You get your PDF. Mm, I can share. There. Let me try to open this up. Mm, cannot um, extract it. Hold on. Okay, let me just give me a minute. Um, is Netscape, they're from Urbana, correct? Is it, they, yeah. They yeah. start Urbana? That's right, yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things. Mark, Mark Andresen, is he still there? Uh, no, no, he's in, in California, but uh, you know, he, he created uh, Mosaic, which is the precursor to Netscape when he was on the staff here. Uh, Stephen Wolfram, another sort of computer scientist slash physicist, is still on the faculty, uh, you know, creator of Mathematica, you know. They, they, and they have, a, I guess, a very active computer community, obviously, and a lot of research is going on there, medical research, besides what you're doing. Well, yeah. So, you know, I think the data analytics aspect of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the ways that these devices operate, um, you know, it's just incredibly essential, you know. So we, we actually have active you know, collaborations with folks in computer science to develop, develop algorithms to understand how to interpret all the data streams off these uh, skin mounted, you know, kind of epidermal electronic devices, as well as some of our, you know, implantable systems. So again, it's a really vibrant atmosphere here and um, you know we can pull in the very best in computer science and electrical engineering get them engaged in these projects and really add kind of a lot of value you know in that in that sense okay let me uh i'm still working on this here let me yeah. see if i can i mean i can say a few words just kind of get started on yeah that. sure you could do that please um, that'd be great yeah so um you know again my core expertise is in electronic uh materials and um you know, that community is, is pretty robust, uh, you know, both at the industrial and academic level. Most folks are thinking about, you know, Moore's Law type trends in uh, conventional computer chips, you know, how to make things smaller and smaller and faster and more power efficient and so on. And that's <sighs> really a trend that's dominating the industry. But uh, where we're interested is to address an aspect of the integrated circuit that really has remained static since the very earliest days of the technology, which is that you know, all such classes of devices are built on uh, rigid platforms, semiconductor wafers. So if you look at your laptop, your desktop, your, you know, your smartphone, you know, those, uh, you know, geometric and mechanical features of the integrated circuits are reflected at the system level in the devices. So your cell phone is flat and uh, inflexible because the guts of it have those characteristics, the microprocessor, the memory chips, the radios and so on. And that's fine. You know, if you want to put your device into your pocket or you want to you know, put it in your backpack, but if you want to take that same technology and leverage it for human healthcare, you might want to put it on your brain, you know, or laminate it into your skin. And none of those kinds of deployments or those kinds of possibilities are, um, are supportable, you know, or can be addressed with integrated circuits and uh, semiconductor devices as they exist today. Mm -hmm. So we've spent a lot of time and effort thinking about how you can create, um, you know, a sensor and a, and a transistor and a circuit technology that, you know, adopts the physical properties of biological systems. So for the skin, for example, we focus on making devices super thin, uh, flexible, also stretchable, soft, compliant, uh, air and uh, vapor uh, permeable, um, so that you can, you know, begin to integrate electronics with the skin much like uh, the way uh, kids' temporary tattoos are, are laminated on the skin um, to establish a really intimate, long-lived, sort of uh, imperceptible from a sensory standpoint uh, form of integration that would be compatible with long-term continuous monitoring and use. And so, you know, I think we've been able to make a lot of progress in that direction over the last, you know, 10 years that we've been working on it. And so the, the results, you know, we refer to as epidermal electronics offers all kinds of new capabilities in, uh, in health monitoring where you can uh, establish data streams that, um, you know, have quantitative correlations to clinical gold standards that you would see in a hospital for things like ECG measurements, precision skin thermography, or 
hydration uh, assessment or EEG measurement, EOG, EMG, various bio potentials you can you can measure, uh, skin stiffness, um, all kinds of parameters that are completely outside of the realm of what's possible with conventional clunky, you know, wristband mounted wearable devices that exist today. So that's a vision for where we think the technology is going into the future. We have had you know, robust academic efforts in that space, you know, where we're publishing all of our results in the peer reviewed literature, many, many papers, you know, over the last uh, five years, especially. And then, you know, looking beyond just, you know, academic demos to, uh, you know, commercial translation. So we have, uh, you know, a couple of companies in place, uh, startups, we work with large companies as well, uh, to try to get this stuff out of a university research lab into the real world. We've done a number of uh, human clinical trials, both in hospitals and in more kind of real world at home uh, settings, demonstrating uh, you know the value of this stuff. And you know we're pretty enthusiastic about it. I mean, I think a lot of the technology components are coming together. The manufacturing routes have been established, and uh, you know I think we're deep deep into human clinical trials, both at the academic level as well as the startup commercial level. And, uh, you know, our, our hope and our belief is that it's really going to change the way you think about electronics as it pertains to human health care and that there, you know, there'll be uh, vast, vast benefits in, in many, many ways in terms of uh, how we diagnose disease, how we treat it, uh, how we handle patients in and out of the hospital and so on. And we're working on, on a number of different axes, you know, to, to kind of pursue these things. Okay, John, I got a workaround, I believe, for your... Uh... PDF here. Let's let's get. Let, I'm going to screen share that right now. And we'll just go slide by slide, okay? Yeah. So is it up? Yeah. Or let, let me get it up. Hold on here. Okay. Do you want me to start with the first slide or the second slide? Um. Yeah, the second slide is good. Let's just start with that. Okay. Let's try Maybe. to step. Step okay, through this pretty quickly. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Get the Q and A because I think the yeah, sure. You see the second slide, right? <clears throat> yeah. So this is just recapping what I just mentioned that conventional electronics is heading down a uh, a path of size miniaturization. Makes a lot of sense. It's a huge industry. That trend is going to continue. Uh, but if you go to the next slide, um, okay. you know, okay. we're thinking about a complementary future where the focus is not so much on spot size and, and speed and cost, but more on mechanics and geometry and biocompatibility. Okay. Where the vision is to try to leverage all the very powerful sophistication in electronics technology that exists in the consumer world and leverage that into human healthcare uh, in a way that hasn't been possible in the past. So we're talking about you know, electronic sheets that laminate onto the surface of the brain to do uh, electrocorticography or stimulation in the context of epilepsy, Parkinson's, things like that, or devices, you know, as illustrated in the cartoon on the right, that, as I mentioned before, sort of melt into your skin uh, and sit there like a kid's temporary tattoo with all the power and sophistication of electronics, but with that kind of tattoo-like format for, um, you know, comfort and wearability and as a way to eliminate any, uh, you know, irritation at the skin interface. You know, there are some companies putting uh, sensors in clothes now. Yeah, I think clothes, you know, that that's interesting. Uh, you know, it's kind of a form of electro textiles, I think is what that field is sometimes referred to. The problem is clothing is not intimately coupled into your skin. If you think right. about, you know, the reasons why uh, wearable sensors more or less are failing, it's because of motion artifacts right. and an inability to really intimately interface with the skin. And I don't think a textile mount solves those problems. So we All haven't right. spent a lot of time on that. Okay. Here's the fourth slide. Yeah. So this is kind of illustrating the content, uh, concept, this epidermal electronics vision, tattoo-like uh, devices, and just sort of outlining some of the physical properties that we attempt to achieve in this class of uh, technology. That's the vision. The first paper that we published that really you know represented a realization of this vision uh, appeared in 2011, just to give uh, folks a sense of the timeline. So this is relatively recent, but uh, it's been around, you know, at least in our labs long enough that we now, you know, have a broad range of very sophisticated capabilities uh, in this type of platform. Now, is this embedded like a typical tap two with uh, sitting down and with a probe 
imprinting the tattoo? Yeah, in fact, I have one of the devices. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, okay, let me get off the screen share. Then I'll, you have one on your body? Yeah, I mean, I kind of wear these things around just for fun because oh, they're cool. cool. Wait, hold on. I got to get this, John. Hold on. Okay, let's see this tattoo. Okay. Uh, so it's. Wow. Uh, now that's it's, actually embedded, or is that like a stick on? It's like a temporary tattoo, so it's um, it's not a sticker in that sense. It's more like uh, you know a transfer tattoo if you've ever played around with that. So okay, well, so they, that's erasable. You can when you're done with it, you can just erase it. Yeah, you can peel it off. I mean, it's uh, it's not necessarily designed to allow removal and reapplication. Although you can do that, these are thin enough that they're they tend to be a little bit fragile. But that thin, soft geometry is absolutely critical to making them wearable. So, I mean, I've had this one on a week and done several workouts and showers and stuff like that. It's very uh, robust in terms of the adhesion. Uh, it reads into a, a smartphone, an Android phone. Unfortunately, this darn phone is not charged up, but it has the ability to wirelessly communicate uh, with a phone. Oh, wow. This is what the device looks like, uh, you know, prior to mounting. So one of the tricks here, the practical challenge is that the devices are so thin and soft, it's difficult to just handle them. So what we do is we put them on a temporary plastic backing. And so you kind of you kind of peel it off on the backside. Um, you know, there's a very mild but uh, biocompatible FDA approved uh, bandage adhesive. It kind of keeps the device uh, stuck on the skin. You apply it. And then there's a top plastic layer that you can peel off to sort of uh, complete the complete the manufacturing, uh, sorry, the mounting uh, process. So. Well, so there's no power source problem because it can transmit uh, data. Well, so this particular device uh, derives power from the phone okay. wireless. Okay. So, um, it, uh, you know, electrical power is wirelessly transmitted from the phone to the device, powers up the radio and the sensors in the device, and then the device is wirelessly transmitting the data streams back to the phone. That's okay. kind of the way it works. You can embed in these same device platforms batteries, uh, but it increases the thickness, obviously, right? You know, the battery is not battery technology is not scaling down in the same way that uh, electronics technology is. Okay. Okay. Let me just quickly go to the fifth slide here. Yeah. So the fifth slide is just uh, sort of emphasizing the points I've already made: is that okay. you know, electronics are formed on silicon wafers, which are basically like plates of glass in terms of their geometry and their mechanics. It's no good for the skin or the brain and the heart. You know, virtually, you know, there's virtually no biological system that has that set of mechanical and uh, geometry properties. So what we've done is illustrated in the next slide is to try to reformulate silicon away from that wafer based sort of platter format into uh, geometries that can afford this kind of low stiffness, soft, mechanics and um, it's not worth going through all the details but what we do is make the uh, silicon very thin that's step one and just by virtue of the fact that the silicon is thin it's flexible and then step two is we configure the silicon in kind of a wavy type geometry bond it to an underlying soft rubber support and when you do that you create kind of an accordion bellows sort of in the in the silicon and in that type of geometry, sort of hard, soft composite arrangement, you have a material then that offers an effective kind of stretchable elastic response, even though the silicon material itself still has its brittle uh, char character to it. Uh, have you done any work with graphene? Isn't graphene supposed to be similar to silicon, but even better? No, I think gra oh. graphene uh, is way overhyped. Um, okay. Okay. Looked at it a little bit. The problem is it's not a semiconductor, so you can't make circuits out of it. Uh, okay. You can do certain things in radio frequency technology. You never make a microprocessor or a memory that would make any sense. Okay. That's number one. Number two is um, it's not manufacturable. Uh, we like silicon because it's building on an incredible base of scientific and engineering capacity that's developed over the last half century, uh, you know, of the electronics industry, global R&D. You're not going to displace that. I think it's unrealistic. So, so uh, you know, graphene is, you know, material. It's cool, but I think it has no relevance uh, okay. to uh, wearables. Is my that's a, that's a good point. It has got a lot of press. 
yeah, it's the typical thing. Hype is uh, getting out of control a little bit. I mean, we're, you know, we want things that have an ability to translate into the real world as soon as possible. And if we can figure out how to deal with silicon and make it do what we think we need it to do uh, to integrate with the skin, for example, that's the route we're going to take because uh, you leverage this incredible manufacturing structure, design tools, you know, whole industries built around silicon, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And we try to get our technology aligned with that rather than uh, competitive against it. Okay, the epidermal electronics slide is up now, the seventh slide. Yeah, so this is an image, a uh, you know, typical device. What I was just showing you is a device like that, but add graphics on top to make it more aesthetic. But you take the graphics away, that's kind of what it looks like. Okay. Um, you skip two slides forward, uh, okay, slide me, nine. Wait, you nine. Okay, let me get to that. The old-fashioned way by manual. There we go. Ele okay. Epidermal electronics. Yeah, it's just a picture of a device very similar to the one I was just talking about and showing you on my arm. It's got the graphics on top. Uh, Illinois Pirate, which we made up, is sort of uh, fitting here somehow with the tattoos and stuff. Um, that's, that's the Illinois Pirate? Yeah, we made it up. We try to push this as the new mascot, you know, because we, <laughs> we don't have the Illini WEC anymore. It's got it. I uh, no issue with that. But anyway, if you go to the next uh, slide, slide 10 is one of these devices. Um, Sure. full radio capability and so on. This is a little bit different in design, but it offers the same soft uh, mechanics. And um, I don't have the movie embedded here, but this allows one to collect clinical quality ECG. So we see one to one correspondence between data collected with this type of skin patch and what you would see in conventional wired up electrodes and bulk hardware. Oh, wow, and transmitted wirelessly to a device. Yeah, uh, in this case to a, a PC, so it's a Bluetooth type of oh, protocol. That's, that's a pretty small. Is there any metal in that? Is that just a tattoo or a metal little piece of metal there? Yeah, so here we tried to uh, align the technology with conventional chip scale uh, components. That's kind of what we've done. That's what you see kind of in the center region there. And then these uh, kind of brownish patches, those are actually very tiny um, filamentary mesh type wiring that establishes the electrical interface to the skin for the ECG measurement. Hmm. And all the guts of the thing in the middle are amplifying those signals and then transmitting them out at radio frequencies to the computer. Is that a one lead EKG? Uh, it's three. Three, okay. Do you know which leads? Uh, one, two, and three? One and two are on the outside and then three is sitting underneath the electronics. They're sort of obscured by the, by the electronics there. Okay, uh, let's see. Which slide would you like now? Yeah, so the next one shows you um, your particular area of emphasis. Let me see. This is a 10th slide here. Okay, the bio uh, integrated electronics? Um, the the one you want? Neonatal intensive care. Oh, okay. Let me go back to uh, that one. It's a slide before? Yeah, it's okay, slide 11, 11 in my deck. Okay. I'm sure it's 11 in. Okay. Water soluble silicon. Uh, this is neonatal. Anyway, we don't need to look at that slide. I mean, it's the point is, you know, for neonatal intensive care, you got lots of straps and wires and electrodes and bulk hardware, and we're trying to move from that paradigm to something that would look more like these highly non-invasive, uh, you know, thin, soft tattoos. You know, and so we have IRB approval. We'll be moving to uh, actual tests and uh, a NICU unit up at Northwestern's Children's Hospital uh, uh, by the end of the year. Okay. Which slide would you like now? Well, so maybe this is a good stopping point. I don't know. You know yeah, how okay. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Time. But that, that kind of outlines the technology. Like I said, we're working on commercial translation. We have things going on in hospitals and whatnot. We can do a lot of different kinds of measurements. Uh, blood flow was uh, you know topic of one of our latest papers in this uh, area. So there we're using kind of a thermal uh, technique to measure volumetric blood flow in near surface uh, arteries. So even uh, flow at the microvascular level, we can measure that. Uh, we have device embodiments that are designed to measure revascularization in skin grafts. Uh, we have ongoing animal experiments with that kind of technology. So I think, you know, from our vantage, it looks like a pretty broad, 
platform, at least the, the concept of this epidermal electronics. And uh, we have lots of different sensor modalities that fit into that framework and provide all of the, the advantages that flow from being thin and soft. Yeah, we have, we have one quick question, uh, John. Uh, someone mentioned, okay, since diabetes is, is basically rooted in a disease of mi microvascularity, uh, have you guys seen a big uh, uh, application for this device in diabetes, early diagnosis of diabetes? Well, that is something we're definitely interested in. Um, you know, the question is, how do you do, um, you know, blood glucose measurement when you don't necessarily have access to blood all, all the time in terms of a skin patch? So either you have to, uh, you know, think about micro needles or reverse ionophoresis to get access to interstitial fluid, and you make the measurement there, uh, glucose level. Or we have a project sponsored by L'Oreal that involves uh, sweat collection and uh, uh, chemical analysis of sweat. So we, met, we have microfluidic uh, channels that we can sort of etch into these epidermal patches. And uh, you know, we use colorimetric uh, uh, analysis chemistries to determine uh, glucose concentration along with pH, uh, sodium concentration, lactate, and total sweat volume loss. So I think to the extent that one could establish a correlation between glucose in the sweat and glucose in the blood, uh, we have something that would be relevant. Uh, that's not the primary motivation for that uh, project, but we are certainly aware of, uh, you know, the applications that might exist in, in uh, you know, related to diabetes, and you know that that that's a future direction for us. Um, okay. Any other? I, I certainly personally can see the application for plastic surgeons after they do a graft. They want to really keep a close monitor: of, is the graft taking or not? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Actually, we have an interaction with um, folks in the army, and there the emphasis is on burns. So same same type of thing, not not plastic surgery, but same type of monitoring uh, is important. Yes, that's yeah. okay. Well, very good. Okay, John, uh, I appreciate your time in uh, in in talking to us, and uh, we hope to keep in contact with any new developments. Just let us know. We'll put you on the screen again. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Okay, John. See ya. I'll okay. send you the link. Okay, great. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.